and welcome to the second webinar series of the ITU Journal on Future and Evolving Technologies. My name is Alessio Magliarditi from ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. ITU allocates frequencies to the services that make use of the radio communication spectrum. It develops standards and assists developing countries in setting up their information and communication infrastructure. ITU and academia share a commitment to the public interest. And this commitment is embodied by the ITU Journal, which offers complete coverage of communications and networking paradigms free of charge for both readers and authors. Our journal welcomes submissions at any time on any topic within its scope. And we believe that this webinar series launched in March this year will inspire more contributions from researchers around the world. It is my pleasure to open this new series today with Dr. Qin Li from China Mobile Research Institute. We count on your support to make this webinar an interesting experience. So please submit your questions via the Q&A channel. We will address them to our speaker during the Q&A session. And after the talk and the Q&A, please stay online. We have something very special for you, the Wisdom Corner, live life lessons. Dr. Chi Li agreed to a very personal chat. She will share with us some lessons learned over the years that might perhaps be useful for some of you. I'm very pleased now to introduce Professor Jana Kilditz, Editor-in-Chief of the ITU Journal and President and Founder of Truva from the United States. So Professor Kilditz is Chen Byers, uh, Ken Byers Chair Professor in Telecommunication Emeritus at Georgia Institute of Technology. In the last two decades, he established many research centers worldwide and is Editor-in-Chief Emeritus of Impact Factor Journals, uh, highly cited and at the top of the most prestigious international rankings. Ian is a visiting distinguished professor in several universities around the world. According to Google Scholar, his H index is 133 and the total number of his citations is over 136K. His current research interests include 6G, 7G wireless communication systems, hologram communication, terahertz, Internet of Bio Nano Things, molecular communication, Internet of Things in challenged environments, and many other topics. So, Professor Akilditz, the floor is yours for your opening remarks. Um, thank you so much and enjoy this webinar. Thank you, Alessia. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening worldwide. I welcome you all to the second season and first episode of our ITU Journal Future and Evolving Technologies webinar series. I have the great pleasure to introduce you one of the leading researchers in our era, Dr. Chinlin Yi. Chinlin has, uh, Chin has over 40 years a super career. She's currently a chief scientist of wireless technologies at China Mobile Research Institute. Chinin is very active or has been very active in many organizations. She's the chair of the ORAN Technical Steering Committee and a member of its executive committee, chair of the future 5G, 6G special interest group, chair of the Wireless AI Alliance Executive Committee, executive board member of Green Touch, string board member and vice chair of uh, Worldwide uh, Radio Forum, steering committee member of IEEE 5G and Future Networks Initiatives, scientific advisory board of Singapore NRF, uh, I assume that's like NSF, and IEEE ComSoc uh, in many, many capacities since over three decades. She published over 200 papers and holds remarkably 100 patents. She wrote many books. And Chin Lin uh, uh, received PhD from E from Stanford University. I can say in the 80s, and not to reveal her age, we met in the late 80s when she was working at Bell Labs in New Jersey. We also worked at the IEEE Compsum Conference organizations together. After a couple of decades at Bell Labs, Jin Lin moved to Asian region. And I can I remember we met during my visit in Taiwan in 2002, 
She was leading this Taiwan big government research organization, as I can recall. Uh, then in 2006, uh, uh, what a coincidence, uh, in uh, millions of people in Beijing, during my visit to Tsinghua University in Beijing, we accidentally bumped each other in the lobby of the hotel while she was visiting China's NSF, as I can recall again. So uh, uh, Chin Lin received many prestigious awards. Uh, for example, 2005 IEEE Complex Stephen Rice Prize, Best Paper Award, and also 2018 IEEE Comstock Fred Ellersick Prize, again, Best Paper Award, and also 2015 Industrial Innovation Award for the Next Generation Cellular Wireless Networks. Let me express my sincere thanks for accepting our invitation and giving the speech, which is entitled, A Peek into the Deep Convergence Towards 6G. Thanks, Xinyan. Thank you, Ian. It's a, it's a actually indeed a my great pleasure to be on this forum. And uh, let me share the screen first and get the show rolling. So um, 6G, I think uh, it's on most everybody's mind that are uh, working in uh, communications, especially mobile and wireless communications. And, and so today I would like to first pick into a little bit of the 6G and kind of uh, uh, focus on a key feature of 6G that is convergence, actually convergence in more uh, way than one. And then finally, zoom in on a specific aspect of convergence, which is the IT, CT, and DT uh, convergence, which I think is bringing forth fundamental transformation of not just our industry, but the whole uh, cross domain ecosystem, and that will impact us all. <clears throat> so there will be uh, kind of three parts in, in this uh, uh, sharing. 6G and the general convergence trends and also the journey of the ICDT convergence. Okay, um, it's clear, uh, I think uh, you all agree that uh, 5G uh, deployment actually is still at the kind of early stage, uh, even though there are more than 200 operators in close to 80 countries that have deployed the 5G network and um, there are some, however, uh, majority of the deployment had been in a uh, non-standalone mode, meaning that 5G is only kind of a uh, uh, add-on pipe to a generically 4G system. And only 10% of the operators that have deployed 5G uh, have deployed a standalone, meaning the, the real pure 5G system. <clears throat> and um, primarily, is the first uh, version of the 5G standards uh, release 15 that's in the field these days. And in China, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, actually uh, uh, it's uh, all the operators in China have deployed standalone 5G uh, for their commercial services uh, since a couple of years ago. And uh, the company I work for, China Mobile specifically, currently has deployed close to 1 million um, uh, 5G base stations. And uh, that alone, it's about 30% of the global 5G deploying today. And in this network, we, we currently have uh, uh, a little less than a billion subscribers where uh, half a billion, uh, more than half a billion have already upgraded to the 5G services, enjoying new way for the video, audio, gaming, and uh, uh, even video shooting uh, capabilities. However, 5G, uh, it's uh, uh, most distinctive value that, uh, and the value proposition to us is really to transform society by serving the various verticals. And <clears throat> we have already um, uh, de developed more than a hundred 
headquarter level SOP projects for this purpose, and uh, plus uh, more than uh, 2,000 provincial level uh, uh, projects serving verticals with regional characteristics. And uh, many of it are replicated and promoted across different industry segments. So currently, um, there are more than uh, 11,000 commercially deployed uh, cases uh, serving various verticals. However, um, this number, uh, considering the potential uh, market, it's still a very small number. And currently, there is still challenges in fast scaled up deployment uh, SOPs for different uh, verticals because the various verticals really has very different needs. And uh, the, the effort that needs to customize and to provide uh, agile deployment and fle very flexible customization ability uh, uh, on, with the, <clears throat> with the cost effective uh, uh, solution uh, is a still uh, an ongoing effort across, I think, the globe, uh, China, uh, the same. Uh, while this is still uh, uh, a major uh, effort uh, in our industry, the Global uh, 6G Research Initiative has already uh, started, actually, since uh, 2018. Various regions have uh, launched a uh, different initiative looking into the early phase of 6G uh, research. And on this page, I'm just showing some examples. You can see that uh, all over the world, somehow uh, the 6G uh, research initiative has become really uh, uh, a heavy focus and uh, it's being accelerated by various initiatives and fundings in many countries and regions. Okay, but uh, a pragmatic 6G uh, development timeline shows that uh, more or less, um, uh, the actual uh, 6G standard uh, effort will officially start somewhere around 2015, uh, probably not before that, between 2015 and 2016, that's when uh, the actual standard effort will start. And which means that uh, actually um, there are a few years yet for uh, uh, real research and real, uh, I would say, uh, hopefully a global so searching um, to identify what's really needed and uh, what problem we really want to solve and what capability we really want to bring. Okay. And of course, uh, the world uh, works in a continuous mode. So uh, it's not uh, uh, like that we will see uh, 6G popping up that has nothing to do with what we have learned and what we have evolved. And the interesting thing to see is that uh, the uh, 5G, uh, the, the 5G and beyond, which I think uh, I should have put the title there, it's called officially the 5G advanced, starting research uh, in release 18 in CGPP, uh, is characterized by three uh, aspects, extreme performance, cloud intelligence, um, and uh, uh, green and uh, efficiency. Uh, and so, and some of this topic, you will see that uh, uh, really uh, is, is uh, going to be uh, a continuous theme evolving forwards, even into the 6G era. Actually, um, uh, uh, my company, China Mobile's uh, uh, vision of, of 6G era is an era of digital twin with ubiquitous intelligence. And center of that is that uh, the network will be uh, made of uh, technology symbolizing uh, the ICDT deep convergence. And some interesting scenario that's being contemplated globally includes a metaverse where um, the real world are um, uh, uh, with the, the, the meta world. Uh, are uh, kind of parallel and highly interconnected, and that you can in in the meta in the metaverse world, uh, you uh, we we would enjoy immersive experience, including shopping, social interaction, and the collaborative work. And uh, this is not only for personal convenience and, and entertainment, but uh, we uh, can envision that uh, this uh, really provides 
many uh, opportunities for innovative uh, uh, services for the vertical industry as well. And another uh, often talked about uh, capability in such era is holographic interaction, okay? In communication, in uh, industrial design, even in medicine, and, and also, of course, uh, for a lot of us for meetings, uh, you will enjoy holographic uh, uh, partners uh, presence. This is something that uh, I think uh, we can look forward to probably even uh, before the 6G network will become widely spread uh, uh, available uh, uh, existence. And an, another very interesting scenario that uh, people often talk about for the 6G era is uh, the interconnection of uh, uh, the five senses. And historically, our 1G through uh, 4G, 5G till now, uh, we know that uh, mostly it's our um, audio sense and the video sense are being connected. But uh, there are various attempts, even since the 5G uh, research started, of uh, the, uh, the touch, the additional sense, and then uh, maybe uh, even involving smell and the taste in the future. There's very aggressive uh, uh, conjecture that uh, uh, in the 6G era sometime in, uh, in, in there, uh, we could extend to even uh, synesthesia uh, perception uh, that is really go across our uh, multiple model of the senses. Uh, how this could be um, accomplished, I think uh, is something uh, very exciting uh, for us to look forward to. And uh, definitely um, we already see certain level of uh, uh, internet of skills that's been provided in the 5G era. And in the future, uh, the internet of experiences, uh, uh, the inter uh, internet of actually multimodal senses interaction uh, may become a reality as well. And to accomplish all of that, uh, there is uh, lots of uh, early stage research and, uh, and uh, effort trying to figure out what exactly the 6G API KPIs are. And this, I'm just showing one example, which was released uh, a few months ago by NGMN as uh, um, the 6G requirements that uh, uh, their first project uh, delivered. And I think this number uh, uh, probably, this set of KPIs are probably in similar range uh, compared to the similar white papers that's been published by other initiatives and organizations. And however, <coughs> uh, one of the key characteristics for 6G design, I think is from the onset, uh, it's not just the individual KPIs, uh, uh, it's a, a important consideration, but also combinations of multiple KPIs, a subset of <coughs> KPIs uh, combined together uh, would also be very important design target in the 6G system. Okay, now before zooming, let's quickly go over some of the interesting uh, trends of convergence in different um, kind of uh, cross field, cross domain, and and uh, cross uh, intersegment. Um, cross multiple expect. The first one that uh, often being talked about is the multi-bands and also space, air, ground, uh, all converged networking. Um, at this point, uh, people are very excited about uh, this future um, that uh, where we would use the, maybe the sub six gig or sub seven gigahertz band to provide primarily the seamless and basic network coverage and then using millimeter wave, terahertz, even VLC, uh, visible light uh, to complement wherever it's appropriate for localized uh, high capacity uh, needs, uh, shorter range and the lower mobility uh, 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 scenario, of course. And then uh, complemented with satellite where uh, right now, uh, I think people's imagination 
covers Geo, Mio, and Leo, all inclusive uh, for um, kind of global coverage uh, over the water, over the mountainous area, over uh, basically provides truly 100% seamless full, full uh, global coverage. Uh, one thing I just I want to caution is uh, I think the complement, uh, complementary services between uh, the space uh, or air based system satellites, that is, uh, with the terrestrial uh, mobile cellular system, uh, has always uh, uh, existed. I mean, <clears throat> in reality, it's just that uh, it was very, very uh, loosely coupled or uh, decoupled. Um, uh, for 6G, uh, it seems that uh, the, the intent is to make the coverage um, much more uh, tight, uh, tightly coupled together, uh, integrated together. Uh, I think it may be an interesting uh, research topic and uh, engineering effort. Uh, however, I would caution to consider how much uh, this convergence, uh, how tight this convergence really needs to be. Uh, to be cost effective, okay. So that that's uh, one thing I do want to bring up. Um, uh, and the other one is in terms of uh, wave terahertz uh, VLC. Uh, personally, I uh, I think uh, we saw uh, uh, we all remember freshly our experience of the wave in the five G uh, efforts. Uh, initially, there was great excitement and the expectation about the meter wave. And mean wave may ev eventually uh, play some role, I think, in the 5G network and going forward for 6G as well. But uh, uh, I think we need to uh, be um, more conservative in our expectation. Uh, that includes meter wave and the terahertz, uh, given the fact that uh, it's uh, uh, really coverage limited and mobility limited uh, solutions. And on, on the other hand, VLC may be a surprising uh, factor uh, uh, to, to combine VLC with uh, 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 microwave system or cellular system uh, as a uh, um, downlink uh, enhancement uh, could be uh, become a cost effective uh, element in the 6G if we make good use of it. Okay, and uh, another uh, convergence is actually uh, introducing sensing into the traditional communication only network, that is our network, um, the integrated uh, sensing and the communication. This has generated a lot of excitement. Um, well, we, our view is that uh, uh, probably the cooperative sensing in a cellular uh, system uh, would be an uh, interesting uh, addition. Um, but we are still at early stage uh, that uh, we have not uh, been able to have a systematic way to uh, quantify uh, the cost in terms of both not just the hardware, uh, with how much, uh, how to minimize the hardware uh, addition, addition uh, but also actually how much um, spectral efficiency for communications uh, that needs to uh, be sacrificed when we incorporate the sensing capability. Uh, hopefully not too much, but uh, there needs to be uh, some effort to clearly quantify it. And uh, uh, moving into a uh, uh, further uh, direction, which is uh, now it's becoming also popular micro area communication technology and uh, some calls it PRAN. Uh, however, this kind of uh, uh, reminds me of uh, uh, BAN, which is uh, I think in the 90s, body area network and view it as extension of end-to-end uh, -end network. Uh, it's interesting, but uh, uh, the tight, uh, I, I would still caution uh, not to over engineer a tight integration of this piece into our 6G uh, design. I think it would be um, a helpful element, helpful addition, but probably doesn't need to be a tightly integrated piece in, in the 6G network. Okay. And, and there's a, a lot of um, 
uh, effort in uh, material uh, science these days, uh, since we feel that uh, uh, it could bring us the next, uh, I guess, quantum leap of the capabilities and the performance of our system. Uh, one hot topic is, uh, that made a comeback uh, is metamaterial. The reason why I say made a comeback is because I think at least 20 years ago, we were looking into metamaterials uh, uh, capability in uh, miniaturizing uh, our devices uh, for wireless communications. And uh, there was some interesting finding in that effort. We found out that uh, we could uh, make use of metamaterial to make uh, one antenna behave like if it's two antenna. However, uh, we needed uh, to make a metamaterial uh, mask, which is uh, still uh, requires the volume of a two antenna. So uh, I hope you understand what I'm saying. So how to make use of metamaterial uh, in, uh, in uh, our effort in 6G system? Uh, is an interesting topic. And currently the most successful one is RIS, uh, uh, reconfigurable uh, uh, RIS. But uh, it, it's very interesting. It, it uh, uh, device technology combined with system technology and the RIS-based wireless relay has been prototyped and demoed in many places. Uh, it could provide uh, coverage, whole uh, coverage, and the regional traffic increase may also be uh, um, aided by this device. However, um, I can't help but think about uh, uh, the tremendous effort that was put in for uh, uh, various uh, wireless relay during the 3G and 4G uh, era. And it didn't seem to uh, become a very important part of our uh, large scale uh, system. So that's just a caution about uh, uh, looking for uh, opportunity for risk based systems. And another aspect of the material uh, science that may, be, may bring major uh, transformational uh, impact is the flexible material from uh, pre creating flexible device and flexible systems. Um, this would enable genuinely wearable uh, computer and smart clothes and uh, provide uh, many opportunities to fit the conformal services of some of uh, uh, the important vehicles. Um, but uh, it seems that there is still great uh, challenges to deal with um, uh, the necessary flexibility and uh, the necessary performance stability uh, because the dielectric properties of this material at the different uh, deformation states uh, is still hard to control. And uh, we, we have some uh, interesting research effort going on and uh, we look forward to uh, good progress in this. And then another um, I guess you could consider conversions also, even though semantic communication was not new. Uh, Jenna had uh, uh, mentioned, uh, talked about it uh, even uh, as early as his uh, uh, classic paper was uh, published. Uh, however, uh, Shannon uh, went on focusing on the bits, but not the meaning uh, of uh, uh, the communication. So now uh, everyone is revisiting the possibility of a, a, a semantic uh, communications. I think this particularly uh, can become handy when we look at um, uh, uh, services in uh, 6G era for vertical applications because many of the application would be task oriented. So and there, if we can find a way to compress redundant and irrelevant info out and so that uh, we would be communicating at the semantic meaning level. This would drastically uh, reduce, uh, I guess, the bits that we, we would need to uh, transmit uh, reliably. So if whether we could find uh, uh, have breakthrough in semantic communications, uh, I think would, uh, would be a very interesting, exciting uh, uh, topic to look into even though some of the, uh, I think, the current so-called semantic communications research work is 
uh, not that different from a traditional source uh, source coding. And uh, so uh, it's, it's a very promising direction and hopefully uh, we will find the proper way to, to uh, do it. And then uh, remember that I mentioned a 6G uh, digital twin pervasive intelligence. Um, so digital twin uh, could be considered for many uh, objects or systems. However, we, I think the most interesting part is uh, converging this concept with uh, four uh, 6G uh, network. Uh, we mean building the digital twin network, the DTN, that can facilitate autonomous uh, optimization, autonomous operation. And then also uh, the digital twin enabled by 6G network. Uh, one uh, uh, most interesting example would be the personal digital twin. And that could be at a different, at the appearance level, at the physical level, or even eventually at the emotional level. But all of this uh, will require a lot of cross domain technology uh, breakthrough or so called convergence. And then um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, energy saving uh, green uh, systems. Uh, we had very early on, as early as 2015, worked on convergence of multiple network. At that point, it was 2G, 3G, 4G. And now, of course, it's 5G. Convergence of the energy saving system across multiple uh, network. And we have deployed that in most of the uh, areas that our network cover. And just activate this system uh, six hours per day we were able to achieve 20% of energy saving. So this is a very important, uh, uh, I guess, direction of convergence as well. And, uh, and I think this is the last uh, general sense of convergence uh, case that I want to share. This is actually something that uh, we did in 2012, which is convergence of the energy sources where we combined the solar panel and wind uh, turbine with fuel cell uh, for a base station and energy supply. And actually, uh, theoretically, it's possible to build a completely self-sustainable standalone uh, base station using this resources. And uh, the only thing that we often need to resupply is pure water. This was a very exciting project, but cost was really high. Uh, uh, part of this system components is very expensive. So we only deployed two of this. And this was uh, exactly 10 years ago. Uh, if the uh, related material uh, uh, could become a lower cost one in the lower cost module, uh, hopefully this would be uh, something we can see more widely uh, applied uh, in the 6G network. Okay. Now, let me zoom into specifically the ITCT and DT convergence. Actually, uh, if you look at our core network of our network, uh, very early on, uh, 2G, 3G, 4G era, the core network already uh, adopted IP, uh, pure IP, which is uh, basically the IT technology. And then 4G to 5G, we see that uh, uh, the uh, service-based architecture and the uh, codification are being adopted. And then uh, currently uh, also actually uh, there was this NWDAF very early on in the 5G era being designed that is bringing AI machine learning the intelligence into uh, the core network. So from the core network, the IT, uh, CT, DT convergence actually started uh, uh, much earlier than in the access network. In the access network, uh, uh, for most of people, I guess uh, uh, you could see that uh, our traditional uh, base station actually has uh, uh, the, the, uh, the individual base station as distributed uh, 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 standalone by itself. Whereas uh, then the <clears throat> Uh, about 10 years ago, we started working on CRAN, where 
we bring part of the base station into a pool, which is the BBO pool. Uh, this CRAN it's centralized and uh, provide also opportunity for collaborative processing across multiple uh, base station and also uh, uh, build up foundation for going into a cloud platform virtualized uh, uh, realization, which eventually uh, actually move into the open and smart ORAN, uh, where actually you see that uh, you have edge cloud where <clears throat> you can bring in uh, co-located BBO function with uh, UPF, which comes down from the uh, from the core network, and also adding the intelligent controller and applications uh, all in one. Uh, actually, let me uh, go into a little more uh, a clear detail. The ICDT journey really uh, we see that into two parts. One is the journey of the cloud run which started since 2011, uh, which is characterized by being efficient, green, and being agile, soft, green and soft. And this was first started in 2011. And then eventually um, uh, in 2013, Etsy has launched its NFV ISD, where initially was focusing on core network, as I said earlier, but we expanded into RAN. And finally, uh, we see that it pro progressed into a uh, several uh, cross uh, ecosystem partnership uh, to ORAN Alliance uh, establishment. And also, even though it started in the uh, 4G era, but in 5G, the commercial deployment, 70% are based on uh, this approach. And the second phase of this journey is the journey of intelligent run that started a little bit later, 2014, 2015 timeline, and the features open and smart. It started from the wireless big data research. Uh, I think this was in 2014. Yeah. And then um, there was an opportunity actually for 5G to start with um, uh, a RAN uh, DA, RDA to, to uh, couple with the NWDA in the core network so that uh, the uh, AI and machine learning capability could be built in in the 5G RAN. But that opportunity was not materialized. So eventually um, there was uh, the ORAN Alliance being established. And currently ORAN Alliance uh, is building on the RIC intelligent controller in a hierarchical manner to fulfill uh, the uh, to bring in intelligence into the RAN, and it's built upon uh, the existing 5G architecture. So if you look at the uh, big picture, you could uh, see clearly that from 4G to 5G, uh, the ICT convergence, which is green and soft, uh, is the main trend, uh, main convergence. But uh, from 5G to 5G advance and to 6G, we will see that uh, the main theme building on the, the green and soft is open and smart. And, and this is the second phase of this journey. And the most important cornerstone event, uh, I think for the ecosystem is the launch of ORAN Alliance in 2018. And, and from, the, from day one, it is targeting to transform the radio access network so that it's open, intelligent, virtualized, and fully interoperable. And it uh, has moved very fast. Uh, actually, uh, it's already uh, close to 350 members today uh, and, and uh, with uh, four and a half thousand uh, global technical experts working together. And all the technical work under the technical steering committee of ORAN is divided up by 11 working groups and uh, uh, three focus groups, uh, three uh, uh, subcommittees of TSC with uh, one open source community and another newly established research group. 
and currently already uh, 85 current version of technical specs building on the baseline uh, 3GPP 5G standards uh, was delivered. And uh, there are open testing integration centers, OTICs established uh, for a fair and transparent uh, and a stable testing environment for various software and hardware uh, solution providers to test it out. Globally, there uh, are seven established, uh, including four in Europe and uh, uh, two in a uh, APAC area and uh, one in uh, North America. And uh, uh, this alliance also has provided so far six releases of open source software and uh, set, have set up three open labs. Uh, the open labs are, I think, one West Coast, one East Coast, both in North America, and the third one also in APAC area. And also held four global plug fest. Uh, every time there is hundreds of global uh, vendors and uh, in uh, half a dozen to a dozen different sites across the globe uh, to, to participate. Uh, more importantly, uh, that this alliance work very uh, actively with uh, industry partners, including Etsy, TSMA, ONF, and CGBP and ITUT, et cetera. Um, a lot of the software and hardware solution has been put on uh, interesting virtual uh, booths for a virtual exhibition, uh, 278 demos uh, specifically. And there is the, uh, the, uh, the address for you to uh, visit if you are interested. And on openness, uh, uh, Orion Alliance looked for open interface, uh, open infrastructure, I mean, I mean open cloud and open uh, source software and the open hardware uh, reference design, etc. And uh, this is a, uh, and on cloud, um, cloudification, uh, this alliance looked into uh, the, the O2 uh, interface where it's an open interface to provide uh, infrastructure management services and deploy management services. Uh, as well as the uh, lifecycle management for all of the virtualized applications. And more importantly, uh, it is a container, uh, con mainly containerized uh, infrastructure with uh, accelerator abstraction layer being defined for different profiles for the accelerators uh, that uh, the, real, the relatively real time low latency processing that uh, RAN uh, uh, processing needs. And this is one example of the latest uh, open uh, ORAN cloud platform version 1.0, which is specifically targeting for verticals and the small sales usage. And as you can see that it uh, uh, has optimized its throughput and average delay and the jitter. Actually the interrupt response uh, is uh, kept below 10 uh, microseconds, uh, 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 the interrupt and also uh, the nanosecond level uh, synchronization. And in terms of intelligence, it includes the SMO and non-real-time RIC in the management uh, uh, plan, where uh, you have O1 for the intelligent FCAPs, you have O2 for the uh, open cloud uh, IMS and DMS, and then uh, you have A1, for, uh, to support a service-based uh, non-real-time read architecture with uh, uh, R1 services, R1 uh, as the interface with all the intelligent applications, R apps, and uh, provide intent-driven automation also. And what uh, um, this non-real-time read is set up to complement near real-time read uh, for uh, different, primarily different role, uh, most of the offline training would be done in non-real-time rig, whereas uh, the, the near real-time uh, inference, the online inference would be done uh, in the uh, near real-time rig. So the non-real-time rig is characterized in the uh, management domain, whereas the near real-time rig is in the control, uh, control uh, domain. 
And currently, uh, there are some good examples, traffic steering, QoS, QoE optimization, and the rent slicing uh, assurance are uh, already uh, uh, realized by this near real-time rig. And uh, the next thing that uh, uh, will be made available soon is rent analytical information exposure, which would uh, expose RAM performance analytics and some predictions so that uh, external third-party applications could make use of. And this is a, a collection of some of the cases in application, in management, in the base station control uh, uh, use cases of uh, the uh, RAM intelligent controller and the SMO platform. And uh, some of the, uh, not field trial, but uh, some of the uh, kind of uh, small scale deployment that was done in Nanjing last year using the hierarchical rigs to provide uh, rain slice SLA assurance, where actually the, uh, the average satisfaction ratio of 94.6% uh, was achieved. And, uh, and also as you can see that it's compared to the other two, uh, one is round robin and the other is uh, the uh, basic uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, it's outperforms uh, both of them. And then for the, <coughs> the, the rig was also used in, uh, in Nanjing for the intercell downlink interference optimization where uh, it could accurately predict uh, the user interference in the downlink and uh, the, the accuracy is uh, close to 93% and provided uh, with that prediction, it uh, managed to provide 10% uh, reduction in bit error rate and also 20% increase in the throughput. I don't have time to talk about how it is done, but uh, um, okay. And then for this one, it's also very interesting. We used uh, the ORANS hierarchical rig to provide um, the uh, valence video uh, quality assurance, where you can see that uh, we can predict uh, the uplink while the, the various surveillance camera are moving around in different environment, we could uh, predict accurately uh, the uplink uh, quality uh, with 98% uh, uh, accuracy. And with that, we can um, provide timely adjustment of the uh, appropriate coder, the video coder rate. Uh, this is without uh, uh, the hierarchical rig, and this is uh, the, with hierarchical rig, and you can see that it really matches the shape of uh, the actual uplink um, uh, quality. And uh, with that, uh, we manage to maintain uh, relatively stable uh, the video frame arrival intervals, meaning avoided uh, major uh, uh, delays like what's shown here without the hierarchical rig, when then you will suffer from frame loss and uh, stalling of the surveillance camera. Okay, uh, several releases has been, uh, has been uh, provided to the ecosystem. The first one was focusing on open, second one intelligent, and the third one will come up uh, as a package of several important features that uh, our ecosystem are waiting for, including um, uh, massive MIME optimization, energy saving, shared OIO, relative exposure, and uh, enhancement on rain slicing. And SMO. And OTICs, I think I have uh, described a little bit earlier, but this is the map of where they are. And there are two more coming up uh, one more in, from North America and uh, one more from APAC. And uh, this is a typical setup of uh, our open, uh, open labs of the open source community where you can bring your latest uh, 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 software uh, realization. Uh, to try out on this uh, testing for CICD pipeline uh, in the open labs. And some sample uh, uh, deployment and trials of ORAN technology by various uh, uh, operators uh, around the globe uh, for, for references. Uh, there's a lot of activities going on. Now, still, all of that work uh, from the work group focus group are uh, solving and providing capabilities uh, building on uh, 5G and in the meantime uh, also getting ready for 6G the NGRG was uh, set up officially uh, in June this year and <clears throat> the its uh, technical oversight committee 
uh, composed of uh, uh, six operators, two from each region, and six uh, vendors, uh, two, uh, two from each of the CT, IT, and DT in the segment, and uh, uh, three academic thought leaders, uh, one from each region, and then a hyperscaler. Uh, to, together, they shepherd now currently five research streams for uh, NGRG. Uh, the first one is on um, uh, gap analysis for interested 6G use cases. And second one is on the overall architecture. And third one on native AI, fourth so one native security. And the, uh, the fifth one is on the platform and the evaluation methodology for 6G concept. And the primary goal is to make sure that, uh, uh, first of all, the, the, their effort would take into consideration of regional research efforts, including ITU and the 3GPP uh, regarding uh, 6G and also avoid incompatibility and make sure that uh, some of the experience and the capability that has been built up in Orion Alliance could be carried forth uh, 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 into the 6G design. <clears throat> okay, uh, very quickly, I just want to talk a little bit about a very important aspect of a convergence, which is uh, cross standards organizations. As an example, on intelligence, you can see that ITOT, uh, Etsy, 3GPP, and ORAN, they all have uh, various efforts. Um, I think ORAN, I have talked a lot uh, about it sufficiently, so let me just quickly uh, show you uh, the 3GPP work on intelligence. Uh, not only uh, SA2 uh, for the core network and SA5 for the management plan, but also uh, now RAN3 uh, on uh, data collection and uh, enhanced the song, and the RAN1 on the uh, CSI feedback and beam management, the position accuracy improvement are all making use, are all bringing AI and the machine learning capability into uh, the standards and Etsy uh, has many uh, committees that I have it all listed here that has AI related uh, work, particularly the experience, uh, ex uh, experiential network intelligence and the zero touch network and service management, ENI and ZSM. And then uh, in ITU, SD 13, 16, 17, 20, all have activities related to AI and machine learning. Now, for cloudification, you'll see that uh, the primary actor are not really uh, SDOs. Uh, yeah, you have Etsy here, and you have, uh, I guess, Oran could, could be kind of pseudo SDO, but mostly, primarily, it is among uh, various. Uh, open source communities, open source initiatives. And you'll see that they are also uh, kind of uh, complementary and interconnected uh, with different focuses. The reason why I'm showing this is because I think going forward um, for 6G, unlike uh, previous generations, I think in addition to 3GPP, uh, there, will, there will need to be explicit and expanded collaboration among uh, multiple SDOs, which would include not just ITU, but Etsy and ORAN, IEEE and IETF to cover fully the ITCT and, and the uh, DT uh, aspects, because this convergence uh, is really major and not all of the aspect could be or should be covered by one SDOs. And even though 3 GPP will still be the main stage where the fundamental uh, 6G uh, spec will come from there. But I really am urging everyone to seriously consider how, uh, uh, how we can form a efficient, explicit collaboration across uh, different SDOs so that we can divide and conquer. And the rest of the reflection here I think it's a kind of a continuation of what I have covered. So I'm not gonna spend time because I think time is up, but I do want to focus on 
this particular uh, aspect on this page. Okay, um, as a reference, there's a, a book on 6G that was uh, published early this year. Um, if you are interested, uh, please take a look. And then also about uh, the ORAN Alliance's 6G effort, the research group will be holding its first workshop on October 20th, agenda is here. And also there is a, a NGRG session in a, a industry summit on Open Run on October 26th. Uh, hopefully you will be interested enough to uh, take a look uh, to see if you would uh, be able to join. Both of these are going to take place in Madrid, uh, Spain. Okay, this is my last page. I think uh, the future belongs to all of us and it has to be created by all of us. Again, uh, all the ecosystem players and, and uh, the collaboration from with among the multiple SDOs uh, will be essential uh, for such a future of multifaceted convergence. Okay. I hope I'm controlling time well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Chinlin. Very nice talk. You mentioned about these uh, uh, the holograms and also the metaverse, as well as the, you do not use the word mass media, but you know, like this, um, these five senses. Can you tell us a little bit more about your activities uh, within China mobile? For example, in mass media, are there some uh, hardware design issues for like sensing, uh, I mean, uh, audio or taste or you know these uh, devices or or platforms for metaverse. Uh, what are the activities within the China Mobile if they are not, of course, uh, confidential, right? Well, uh, yeah, sure. We actually um, first I want to tell you a uh, a story of uh, the Internet of Taste that was prototyped in the 90s using a 2G network that I had the pleasure of visiting by a different company. Um, I, was, I was very curious about it when they mentioned that, okay? And then uh, it turned out that it was, uh, uh, you, you are just transmitting some uh, simple bits because uh, at the receiver side, there is a, a kind of a, a rotating plate with eight different uh, uh, fragrance of uh, perfumes. So now you know the solution, right? Just, you just send the bits uh, that will tell you which of the eight uh, uh, fragrance that uh, is being transmitted and that would be, oh. uh, that perfume would be activated <laughs> yeah but that's the in ancient times right with 2g <laughs> this was this so was just 2G. Assign this mapping <laughs> problem right so this, you <laughs> okay but now we have much more sophisticated technology right with like the sensing sensor devices uh, right. i think there are some uh, hardware design going on in the world i'm not sure about in China mobile that, uh, you know, they have these sensors, they can uh, get the taste or the smell, and then they can uh, pack that and transmit as data. There are some uh, work going on. So I want to know, do you have those activities within the China mobile uh, or like these metaverse platforms? I assume, I mean, China mobile, China is a big market, right? So you must have some platforms that we, we do not know here. So most of the platforms we know, they're all Americanized, you know, but in, in China, uh, you know, is there, I'm sure there are many of them. So how far are you? Are you uh, leading that better than Americans or what's going on? Um, first, uh, I don't think we are leading. And then second, that uh, uh, if, if we are leading, probably not, to, not done by China Mobile, that, so that I'm not aware of. But I think um, uh, 
certainly the, the touch, the senses are being, uh, I think, uh, closer to, uh, to being materialized. Uh, but the, in terms of the taste and the smell, I haven't, I haven't personally seen any. But the closest one was the one I just told you. This was in yeah, the 90s. Yeah, long time ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But lots of people are very excited about this possibility. And also something that always gets me very uh, curious in, uh, is about this uh, so-called uh, synesthesia uh, perception. Uh, and um, I'm not sure how much experience and data we have for that, because supposedly uh, maybe when you see something, you feel like you smell something. So you, you use maybe your uh, visual uh, stimulant to trigger a sense of a smell. I don't know whether that, that is uh, something that can, uh, can provide uh, kind of uh, the transmission of, of the senses. Maybe that, that could be uh, one possibilities. But no, I don't, I don't, I don't personally, yeah. I'm, I'm not privileged to know uh, anything that, uh, uh, that is uh, close to reality, even in the labs, no. You know, I, uh, I changed the, uh, the focus now. I wanna go to this uh, uh, open network foundation type, you know, the STN, NFVs, et cetera. And I used to work with Huawei in uh, uh, Shenzhen 10 years ago. We got like many patents during that time. Like all these, you know, controllers, multiple controllers, load balancing, et cetera. But those years, we did not use any AI or machine learning techniques. So since you are leading uh, many efforts in that front, uh, I don't follow the literature anymore the last four years. Uh, are there a lot of, uh, 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 is there a lot of research going on that these people are looking into how AI and ML can uh, be used uh, to have much more sophisticated, uh, like, you know, for example, slicing or uh, like software defined networking. Like, I'm talking what, about also what, automatic what, network slicing, right? So, well, you know, you know that uh, there is this uh, uh, hot topic called the uh, 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 autonomous driving network. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I don't personally like that term, but I think uh, um, certain level of uh, autonomous operation and optimization uh, will be hotly pursued, uh, not just for 6G, but I mean, actually 5G advance uh, will be doing that as well. And the, the, the only thing is maybe currently uh, the step that's being taken by 5G advance is still like very small steps, very, um, uh, but but like um, what we do in uh, Orion Alliance is not something that overnight happens because we started looking at in the initially we call it the wireless big data, what we can do, and what kind of data we need, right? Where can we get it? And and, and so uh, we actually started this in 2014 2015 timeframe, and so we actually used this. AI or machine learning uh, uh, technology to try to uh, solve lots of uh, um, optimization problem in management domain, uh, in, in control uh, domain as well, including like, uh, like you said, load balancing, we actually do it. And uh, in energy saving, we actually do it. And uh, in mobility management, in interference optimization, and in QSQOE, actually, uh, we like a cross domain optimization. I, I showed some examples that we did in Nanjing and Hangzhou, which the cities you know, right? You're being in China. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So we actually um, can use the AI machine learning uh, to do certain pred level prediction and to provide, uh, in turn, with that prediction optimization. And I think more interestingly is uh, we are trying to work out a way to be able to share and expose the prediction and the state uh, for third party application developers so that they can use that information to also optimize the performance of their 
uh, applications. So uh, it is, as we are talking, it is going on right now, but you will see that it would be easier uh, to be put into the actual network uh, for the management uh, plan optimization because uh, you know the, the, the time uh, is not, uh, usually is a much coarser uh, time resolution uh, that is more realistic. But to build it into the control plan uh, is probably something that the 6G era, 6G network design uh, should start with. I, I, I used to say, um, CRAN uh, started after 4G was already spec'd out, right? So CRAN capability, the, the green and the, the soft capability, uh, and also the centralized uh, deployment, et cetera, uh, would be a starting point for 5G. And, and now I think uh, the analogy that I would apply is ORAN, which would have the uh, uh, embedded intelligence and machine learning. This uh, really, as far as RAN goes, only started um, after the, uh, the 6G, uh, 5G spec is already spec'd out without it. But this would be the starting point for 6G. And as you can see that the 5G advance is already slowly uh, bringing some of the element except uh, with very small steps. Yeah. <laughs> but but it should, this should be, I mean, all of this uh, accomplishment and uh, capability should be uh, definitely the, the starting point for 6G design. The 6G should be designed with uh, embedded uh, intelligence, which means that a lot more data in the network needs to be available as a built-in capability, right? I mean, today, uh, there's a lot of data that's um, not available to operator or to third party. Uh, it's, it's kind of a co closed in a black box. But going forward, uh, built up being a, a data availability being a built-in characteristic needs to be there. So that uh, 6G would be designed from day one with native uh, AI. You know, uh, you mentioned about uh, data. Uh, you know, we have all this quality of service notions and quality of expectations. And also the quality of data is becoming more and more important because we have a terabyte or zettabyte of data floating around. There are these data brokers and it's really time to also uh, distinguish between the quality of data, right? That's maybe the semantic communication may be going that direction too. Like, you know, how meaningful is the data that you are getting or collecting? And uh, so, uh, especially for 6G, we'll have all these platforms you mentioned about uh, holograms and, and uh, avatars. I call them avatars, by the way, digital twins, and also the uh, like uh, metaverse. There will be gigantic data floating around, right? So it will be really good to look at quality of data also, like, you know, what is the meaning of quality of data, right? So it's okay. because it changes based on person's interests. I mean, Agreed. some data that it's interesting, important quality for you, maybe it's not for me. So it's really a difficult question, actually, you know? That, uh, that, that, that's indeed true. I think uh, uh, data as the core, as the base for everything going forward will be, I think, one of the major challenge because our experience shows that uh, even when we were doing our early stage um, data, which was not really the control or scheduling domain, it's the management domain. And the data we can get from the actual network, you will see that there's a lot of uh, uh, polluted or uh, incomplete or missing or redundant. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, can, any problem you can think of uh, for the data, it, they exist. And uh, it, tur it uh, turned out that uh, the effort that you need to sort out the data and, and uh, get a set of useful clean data uh, in shape. That effort actually 
it may be much greater than the effort of coming up with the best algorithm or best AI or machine learning models uh, from this data. So um, this is a major challenge for sure. And another thing is, um, uh, when I remember when we first started the, the launched the Oran Alliance, one of the focus group that we want to set up, okay, because we have standard development focus group, open source focus group, and also a testing and integration focus group, in addition to all the uh, working groups. One of the very first focus group we wanted to set up was called open data focus group, uh, because First, recognizing how important data is. Second, also there was a crying out uh, for use for open data set from our ecosystem, from academic community to industry, every alike. But that focus group has not been set up <laughs> even today. It's very difficult, yeah. very, very difficult. Yeah. Uh, well, I have one more question. Uh, by the mid 2025, China was planning to have these autonomous vehicular uh, traffic. Uh, what's going on there? You know, is it, are they still developing it? Because communication is a very important subject there, as you know, like the driverless cars, in other words. So is, is it uh, uh, still the target or what's going on? Well, you know that uh, actually um, the driverless vehicles already are in use in some uh, some area oh. but in general in general it's a closed campus right and and uh, there are also very large scale uh, trial field where it's a hybrid with some of the kind of a private uh, isolated <clears throat> territory combined sometimes with the uh, open road, okay? But oh. yeah, but uh, uh, whether by 2025, uh, there will be large scale nationwide deployment, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, because there's a lot of interest in this. Some, there is, uh, there's at least, I think three forces, right? One are the, um, um, uh, automobile uh, manufacturers, uh, some may feel that they don't need a network. They can just build the intelligence uh, with enough sensors. Okay. I remember I was very, I don't want to say traumatized, but, but very uh, whatever impressed by uh, um, NVIDIA's uh, uh, God, uh, yeah. you know, reason. Yeah. <laughs> he told me that they don't need any network because as long as you have of <laughs> NVIDIA in the vehicle coupled with enough sensors and, yeah. and LADAR as well, then uh, oh, any cars can be made uh, independent, uh, the drivers. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the second, the second force is, uh, of course, um, the operators like us that we would like to be the one uh, facilitating, able, building that uh, ability uh, with our uh, all-encompassing coverage of our network. And, but there is yet a third one, which is uh, um, the, the transportation department, the transportation industry, right? Because the road, uh, the roadside unit uh, uh, is um, generically, if they don't belong to operators, the roadside units, uh, infrastructure uh, is easily deployed by the transportation industry or the road, uh, uh, the public road bureau. So I think there are all these forces trying to make this happen. And maybe, I don't know about you 2025, know, but- uh, <laughs> I, I think there must be a backbone network because some the, some data must be collected what's going on in the on the roads, right? Uh, so maybe they say we don't need it, these drivers or whoever the owners, but the transportation department may need the statistical data, what's going on in terms of you know, accidents or any problems. So there must be some network in my opinion, but the question is who will pay for the services, right? <laughs> so the users may not pay, yeah. 
Yeah, you know, uh, let me say this also, because I've shared this uh, in some other occasions a while back uh, when autonomous driving became a topic. I always thought it would be easier if we identify one lane on the road as autonomous driving lane so that um, anybody who is tired of driving can just uh. enter that lane and then all the vehicle on that lane would be controlled by you know um, uh, some special, whether it's roadside unit or it's inter-vehicle communication so that they are kind of uh, uh, all behaving uh, uh, properly, right? Uh, and, then, and then so the challenge would just be how you enter such a lane safely <laughs> and how you want to drive or if you want to turn or exit, how you come out of that lane safely. So I thought this would be a scenario that can be deployed globally the easiest everywhere. But somehow I haven't seen that uh, that that happen. I agree. I, I agree with you. That's the easiest and the fastest solution. Like we have these HOV lanes here in the US, right? Yes, so yes, yes. Multiple people. You just but you cannot enter all the time. So there are always certain areas you can enter HOV lane, and then you continue, and then again certain areas you can leave. Yeah. So that would be interesting. But uh, so. Still not uh, totally uh, deployed then, what I understand in China, because I, I thought that you uh, folks are very ahead of us, but so it's still uh, going on. So it's interesting. Okay, yeah, Chinlin. Sorry uh, for uh, interrupting you. There's one question in the Q&A box, if you want to check. Oh, okay, good. Thanks to, for reminding me. Uh, the question is, what will be your moonshot for 6G? Yeah, I am a little okay. bit too old to have a uh, uh, wild imagination uh, for moonshot, okay? Because metaverse definitely is a moonshot of a moonshot, I think. Um, but I think a reasonable uh, degree of uh, a uh, digital twin network for 6G uh, would be my moonshot. I think... Uh, um, that would definitely be uh, that, that would require a very uh, efficient uh, integration of all of the technology, IT, DT, and, and CT. And um, I think I would be happy if the CG network really were designed with actually embedded intelligence and has a clever way of uh, ensuring the availability and the quality of the data that's needed and, and, and uh, providing um, sufficient level of uh, uh, autonomous uh, operation, both in management and, and, and the control and, and the scheduling domain. I, th I think, uh, sorry that it, it doesn't sound very, uh, I guess the old word is sexy or, or exciting, but Maybe. I'm too old. I'm no, too no, old no. You are not moon old. that way. No, but, no. but I'd be happy if 6G would, would, would accomplish uh, what I just so, said. Maybe I can add my opinion about this after I found out what moonshot means. So uh, <laughs> again, the, if that's, that's the meaning of the question. So uh, the moonshot for 6G or 7G or 8G will be the propagation delay problem. Okay, as long as we are not in the quantum communication domain, then we'll have this propagation delay effects. And since we have all these latency problems for the applications also mentioned by Dr. E, that is uh, like all these metaverse and holograms and, uh, and uh, uh, some other applications here, uh, the latency is the biggest problem. And uh, uh, whatever we'll do, intelligence edge computing with all this AI machine learning. Uh, the problem is we cannot beat the nature about uh, propagation delay unless we move to quantum communication. And although the quantum communication is really since three decades that I'm alive or maybe longer, 
up and coming, up and coming. Everybody is doing quantum communication. We are far away from that, really. So uh, believe me, it's like, you know, you cannot deal with these gigantic uh, data centers running around with data centers in our hands. <laughs> quantum, there is no quantum cell phone even. Forget other things, right? So it's very cumbersome, but long time, maybe not in our lifetime, but uh, I think the propagation delay must be uh, somehow combated over the century, I mean, decades. And that's the only way is the quantum communication, in my opinion. So I hope uh, you know I could answer your question too, in terms of the propagation delay, which is actually good that we are. Uh, 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 there is another question, which is good that we make uh, you know living out of this, right? We do research and <laughs> trying to combat these problems. Anyhow, there is another. Uh, his name is Ashraf. Uh, uh, like ashram in India, right? Could you please show the slide of your 6G book once again? Do you, can, can you see it? Yes, we yes. can see it. Okay. So you are the author of this chapter, right? Right, right. Okay. It's edited, uh, I mean, the, the, the editors are, are on the cover, I can see. Yeah. Wiley. So I hope you're fine, Asha. Okay. Okay. Any questions? I think, uh, uh, again, I would like to express my sincere thanks to you, Chinin. And uh, uh, we close the Q&A session. And Alessia will start the uh, Whisper Corner or what a Wisdom Corner, right? <laughs> whisper Corner. Wisdom Thank you corner. so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks okay, again Alice. for moderating this session and thank you to our speaker for this very interesting and informative presentation. So yes, yeah, let's move to the Wisdom Corner live, uh, life lessons, uh, which is based upon the idea to give uh, a unique and special angle to this uh, series of webinars, adding a personal touch. So successful researcher like Dr. Chin Lee today will guide students and young scholars in the field of current ICT research. And we'll also share some impactful life lessons. So I would start with my first question. So Dr. Chinli, which is your hard earned life lessons or failure that you would like to share with us today that might perhaps help someone attending the webinar? Okay. Um, it's hard to, uh, to identify a single event of uh, uh, harder lesson. I, I, I would think that uh, as I, but this could be personal because maybe uh, my view of uh, the world used to be simplified, very much simplified. So uh, there is the right way, there is the wrong way, right? Uh, but uh, actually, uh, as I get older, I think I've learned that uh, um, there is always uh, uh, a variety of options because uh, uh, if you if you have a, just like wireless communication has diversity, right? If you have a diverse uh, background uh, uh, put in together, you actually could find the best way. And, and so, uh, in when I was younger, I kind of uh, tend to insist it's my way, it's the right way, <laughs> but uh, uh, actually. Uh, it's only after uh, I joined the, the old at and Bell Lab research. Uh, it's from my esteemed colleagues, I learned that uh, really there is not a, a, only one right way in solving a problem. Okay. Uh, so just be uh, open-minded. I think that's very important. So the second question is, uh, which strengths and capabilities do you think that students and young scholars should be most focused on developing and how they should accomplish this? Uh, I think, to me, I think uh, what I benefited the most uh, throughout my life is curiosity. I think, uh, 
life is a very precious journey. And uh, for your, um, uh, I mean, the, the opportunity to learn, continuous learning and, uh, and uh, be curious. And also do not take the answer from the books as the only answer and final answer. Dare to challenge, dare to ask questions, dare to try things that uh, there is no set paths, there's uh, no one else has done it before. I think um, that is a capability that uh, would uh, bring you um, a very exciting career. Thank you. And in which field uh, in particular, and in which topics uh, would you recommend students uh, to, to study? You know that uh, there's a lesson that I, I learned actually at the high school, no, middle school graduation ceremony of my youngest boy. Um, the lesson was given to all of the parents in that ceremony uh, by the middle school principal. The principal um, reminded all of the parents in, in that uh, event that please uh, know this, time your kids, meaning the middle school graduate in those days, uh, by the time your kids uh, is ready to become part of a, uh, um, become adult, uh, enter the society, the world would be so different from that day, today, in that day. Uh, so do not assume you always know what's best or what's the only thing that your, your son or daughter should pursue because they will know uh, better than you because the world is constantly changing. Okay, but having said that, I would, I, I would want to say uh, in addition um, to as long as you are always interested in learning and you are curious and you will benefit from it, in addition to that, I think any field you are interested in, uh, as long as you love it, as long as you have passion, you will do well. But there is one thing I think going forward, very important, that is for most of the people, uh, you, would, uh, you would do well by having cross-domain knowledge, cross-field, knowledge and experience, okay? So you need to, uh, in a way that for the thing you really, really love, you need to have a depth, okay? But in addition to that, it's important you also have knowledge of, you know, in addition to this vertical depth, you have a horizontal layer of cross-domain knowledge. That is very important. Okay, and for example, um, we talked about uh, intelligence, the AI machine learning a lot. I think going forward, it doesn't matter what field you are, okay, you will probably always need a little bit of ability utilizing AI and machine learning as a tool to enhance what you're doing. But you also need to keep in mind that uh, after all, machine learning and AI, pure data-driven solution, uh, may not be the most efficient approach because a brute force throwing in you know, computers and the computing power may not be the right way to do. First of all, it's not very green, right? So uh, you should also remember there's a lot of experience and knowledge that has been built up prior to this day. So the best way going forward would be AI plus HI. Okay, artificial intelligence hybrid with human intelligence. I think going forward, that would be uh, uh, some uh, principle that uh, 
doesn't matter what field you are in, you, 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 you need to keep in mind. Wow, thank you so much. And, 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 yeah. oh, and one more thing, one more thing is I would like to uh, call the, to action and attention for all the young scientists and technologists to remember um, why you are doing it and what, uh, what is the, uh, the real meaningful and valuable uh, goal of what you do. Uh, I think, for example, when we talk about 6G, um, very early on, many researchers already thought very well to incorporate UN's SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals, into consideration. So even if we are mostly uh, uh, majoring in STEM, I think uh, reasonable consideration of the societal uh, impact and what's really valuable, uh, what's really sustainable. I think uh, it's very important to, uh, to have that mindset. Because the future, uh, for better or for worse, will be enjoyed, hopefully not suffered, right? <laughs> by, the, <laughs> by the young technologists that's uh, that's uh, 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 that we are, we are, we are uh, sharing this with. Thank you so much. Uh, very interesting. Wow. Um, and tell us one of the most tangible contributions that uh, you have made uh, um, uh, in your career that had an impact on your life, professional or personal life, and uh, that, that you're most proud of. Well. Technically, uh, I, I have done a lot of uh, interesting things. I always consider myself very lucky that uh, I work in this field. Actually, my, uh, my PhD dissertation in Stanford University was on satellite communications. <laughs> but ever since I started working, uh, I stayed on the terrestrial system mainly, even though now for 6G, some people are start looking at uh, satellite again. But um, I think I was very lucky to be part of this very exciting industry in its uh, flying and growing uh, phase for many decades. And uh, I did something I think was uh, fundamental in the CDMA system, but to me, I guess the latest is uh, something that you remember the, 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 the clearest, right? I think my effort going from um, green and soft to open and smart that carry forth um, our effort from CRAN to wireless big data to, uh, uh, to ORAN is something personally I feel the strongest about. Uh, of course, this is the past 10 years and so maybe I remember it the most, but I kind of feel that uh, the impact particularly of ORAN Alliance uh, is very, very visible, even though it's not without the controversial uh, controversy because of some regional issues and uh, uh, industry uh, incumbent players versus, you know, the emerging new players. Um, but I feel that uh, uh, clearly focus on this IT, CT, and DT convergence and uh, recognizing that um, this is really a uh, a necessary and essential way for uh, for the future um, that uh, because our ecosystem I mean, our industry the wireless communication uh, industry has enjoyed great uh, uh, growth in in the first uh, uh, three four decades it's still growing but we have seen I, I think that more than 10 years ago we have seen that uh, the industry is really kind of stagnating and uh, there is obvious uh, upcoming transformation that needs to take place to change the ecosystem so that we can embrace and welcome a lot more new players joining this ecosystem and making it a open, embracing and, uh, and, uh, and uh, agile uh, future. Uh, I think so far I feel that the Orion Alliance 
is doing that, even though um, there's still a long way to go to, to, to the time that we can say mission accomplished. But this is something that I feel uh, very close to heart and, and uh, very happy about. I think um, I look forward to uh, a lot more good works and the great works uh, together with everyone globally on this. Thank you. And my last question, that something more personal maybe, is there is there a motto or an aphorism, a book, uh, a movie, a piece of art, music that you would like, uh, that describes you best and you would like to share with us before closing? You know that uh, I, th I think uh, it's nothing fancy, but it's just something that, that uh, I actually wrote in the uh, in the graduation uh, uh, book when I was graduating from college. Actually, I was still in Taiwan at the time. And uh, you know, there's we have a tradition of writing something, OK? Uh, each of the graduates would write something on the graduation book. I wrote something very simple, uh, plan, uh, which is uh, do what you love and love what you do. Okay. Um, I think both are very important. And uh, I feel that uh, somehow just uh, from the bottom of my heart, that's something that I have uh, been living with. Do what I love and love what I do. And I feel very blessed with that. Thank you so much, really, for being so generous and for sharing with us uh, these really inspiring life lessons uh, and peels of wisdom. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, Ian to join us before we close. And yeah, Back. thank you so much. And Ian, yeah, now we can see you. Yes. I would like I, to thank you both. Ian, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Alessia. Thanks for uh, leading the last session. Again, Chinlin, uh, really thank you for uh, spending time with us. Hope we'll see you in person someday again. And enjoy the rest of the week. And I think it's evening, right, in Beijing. Are you in Beijing or in the US? I am currently in Beijing. OK, so it must be evening. So enjoy your evening. Okay, and I will. Uh, so stay Thank safe you. and healthy and uh, good to see you, really. Thank you very much. You. And we look forward to seeing you all also for the next webinar on the 27th of September. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.